All right, welcome back. In this final video on managed funds, I'm going to touch on managed fund performance. So we'll start off talking about how you actually calculate the return on mutual funds, which is a pretty important formula. And then I'll walk through the arguments surrounding managed fund performance over the past several years. I've put together a huge amount of, well, some information, I can't say a huge amount, uh, showing the performance of managed funds and the evidence of skill or no skill amongst those fund managers. And then I'll talk about some of the issues with that evidence. All right, so how do you actually calculate the return on a mutual fund? Well, we generally can use this formula right here. Maybe there's some modifications out there that some people choose to use, but in general, if you're trying to calculate the return on a mutual fund, you take the NAV or net asset value at the end of the period, minus the net asset value at the beginning of the period, plus any income, so dividends or bond coupons that you receive as an investor, plus any capital gains distributions during the period of investment, and then divide all of that by the NAV at start of the period. Now, I, I should point out this is the calculation for open-end mutual funds. I'm using that uh, you know, only. So let's take a quick example. Your initial NAV is $20. You receive $0.15 cents in dividend distributions per share. Your capital gains distributions are, oh, let's say 5%. Uh, and then your NAV at the end is $20.10. What is your return on this mutual fund investment? Well, pretty straightforward. We just take the NAV at the end, minus NAV at the beginning, plus any distributions, minus or at plus any capital gains distributions, and divide by our initial NAV. So our total return on this is going to be 1.5%. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so now on to past performance of managed funds, namely mutual funds. So how have mutual funds performed historically? Well, depending on how you measure it, you could say that mutual funds as a whole have underperformed in the last, oh, 40 or 50 years. So there's a study out there that looked at the uh, mutual fund industry as a whole. They compared the performance to the Wilshire 5000 index, and they found that in 25 of 41 years over this time period, 71 to 2011, they underperformed after you take out fees. And they also found that bad performance was more likely to persist. In other words, the bad managers, the managers that underperformed, so they had negative alpha or they underperformed their lipper averages, uh, they continued to underperform. So why do we continue to hear the phrase, oh, I don't know, X percent of our funds beat their three-year lipper average? Well, it's because there are many ways fund myth fund families can manipulate the number of managed funds that they, they actually manage. Poorly performing mutual funds are often liquidated and funds are placed into another fund in the same family that did outperform its three-year Lipper average. So for example, if a fund family had 10 mutual funds and five outperformed and five underperformed their Lipper, Lipper average, the fund family could close the five underperforming funds, move those funds into the outperforming funds, and then claim that 100% of the active funds beat their three-year Lipper average. The choice of benchmark is often left to the discretion of the manager, which allows the manager to maybe pick a benchmark that could have a lower return than the fund itself. Now, I do have a couple of final explanations for why mutual funds underperform the market. First, many mutual funds are prevented from investing more than 5% of their assets in any one security. This means that the manager can't significantly overweight the, any one security in the portfolio, even if they have a strong belief that that security is undervalued. Uh, just as a side note, our student managed investment fund, we have that same requirement in our fund's prospectus. We cannot invest more than 5% of our portfolio in any one asset. So for example, uh, in the fall 2023 semester, we found that uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, was extremely undervalued. It, and so we wanted to invest a large amount of money into Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC. 
The downside there is that we couldn't invest more than 5% of our portfolio into TSMC. So any potential gains that we would have gotten had we overweighted by you know, more than 4, 5%, uh, we, we lost. It was an opportunity cost there. And that's a condition that a lot of mutual fund fa managers actually face. All right, now this is a table that I copied from a paper by Gene Fama and Ken French that came out in 2008. And it shows the historical performance of mutual funds. Now, the authors sort mutual funds based on their gross returns over the past 60 months, and they place each mutual fund into one of 10 portfolios. Now, the future performance of the mutual funds that perform the worst over the past 60 months is reported right here, while the future performance of the funds that perform the best over the past 60 months is reported down here. Now, the authors report the mutual fund alphas over the next three years. So this is our first year after portfolio formation. This is our second year and our third year. Now, notice here that the funds that perform the worst, there's actually some very, very limited, uh, very weak statistical significance here that they will underperform over the next year. There's no evidence that they'll underperform over their second or third year after portfolio formation. Uh, now, down here, though, we, what we see is that the funds that perform the best, you know, the highest performing 10% of funds, they absolutely have better performance over the next year. And that's statistically significant at the 5% level. So 12 basis points a month, that's you know, pretty significant. Now, in this table, Fama and French repeat the procedure, only this time they take into account fund fees or the mutual fund fees. In other words, they sort the mutual funds into 10 portfolios based on the returns they offered shareholders minus any fees. Now notice that once you sort funds into portfolios based on returns net of fees, as we call it, the fund alphas are not statistically significant over any period longer than a month. So down here we have the one month performance, and what you can see is that the funds that underperformed over the past five years they do have a bit of underperformance in the first month after portfolio formation, but really there's nothing here. I mean, there's some weak significance here, but that could just be like random finding. Uh, same thing here. Once you take the performance net of fees, there's really not a whole lot of predictive ability here. So what this really says is that the you know ultimately, once you take into account fees, there's really not a whole lot of consistency or ability of managers to continue to outperform uh, the benchmark or, you know, continue to perform well. You know, there's no statistical significance here in either direction. So what does this mean? Well, if managers don't offer a lot of skill or a lot of value once you take out their fees, ultimately, why shouldn't you just index? And this is something that we've seen, a trend we've seen you know, happening more and more. So here's the breakdown of indexing versus active management in 2010. I pulled this from a paper in 2015. And what you can see is that, you know, say by country, some investors, you know, some countries, their investors are very, very likely to explicitly index or even just be closet in indexers. So, you know, these are fund managers and some of them will explicitly state that they're indexing while others won't actually say that they're indexing or engaging in passive management, but they actually are. And then the green here indicates the truly active management. Now the US, right here in 2010, uh, notice that just over 40% of all managers are doing some form of indexing, either explicit or implicit. You know, their tracking error is very, very low relative to uh, a benchmark index. So you can get a sense here that in some places, Indexing is very, very common. And, you know, I have this data as of 2010. If I were to show this in 2022, 2023, 2024, uh, these, the green portion would absolutely shrink and the blue and red portions would absolutely increase. So let me show you also the fees around the world. You know, if, if fund manager fees are very, very high, you know, and they don't offer skill, it makes a lot of sense that a lot of investors would just want to invest in index funds or ETFs. And 
you know, these fees around the world that mutual fund managers actually charge, uh, they vary pretty dr dramatically. I mean, Poland, look at that, you know, between 3 and 4% on average, depending on whether these are active funds or closet indexers. Looks like there's a lot of, uh, oh, it, unethical stuff going on there. If a closet indexer is charging a 4% fee, that is just, that should never happen. That should be reversed. The green square should be uh, switched with the red dot. And red dot should be down here because it's a closet indexer. But for the most part, the funds that are actively managing historically are going to have the highest uh, fee, the highest expense. Whereas the actual indexers, you know, the, the explicit indexing funds, should have the lowest fees, which is exactly what we find here. Now, if we look at the expense ratios through time, you can definitely notice a trend. I mean, uh, you know, fees do appear to increase in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. But at some point, right around, oh, 2005, 2006, we started to see some massive consolidation. And, you know, basically what we've seen since about 2004, 2005 is that expense ratios have been falling off a cliff. And this trend, if I had the data for past this, uh, it would continue to decrease. Okay, now the final study I want to show you the results from is this paper by Doshi et al. 2015. And they do something a little different than what Fama and French do in their 2008 paper. Uh, so they sort portfolios into 10 deciles, and they look at the gross and net returns. I think they're looking at a different time period as well. But what these researchers do is they break up the returns into uh, selectivity and timing characteristics. So how much of the performance in terms of returns came from the manager's ability to select the right stocks versus their ability to time the market. And uh, right away here, what we can see, we can see a couple of things. But notice here, if we look at the gross returns and net returns, there is this, I think, uh, completely just linear relationship. You know, the funds with the highest returns, they do appear to have better selectivity ability. Whereas these funds, uh, you know, that are less actively managed, uh, they, they appear to have lower returns and then also less ability to predict uh, good, you know, uh, good stocks. So ultimately, what these researchers find is something kind of counter to what Fama and French actually find. They do find that if you sort based on active portfolio management, so not just the, you know, the fees or the actual performance itself, but rather the active management of the fund, the, the percentage or the weight of the portfolio that is different from the broad inch, uh, index or the benchmark that the fund is being compared to. The funds that are more actively managed, they do actually offer higher performance than the funds that are less actively managed. Uh, we can see that down here with the T-stats the and obviously the difference in returns and uh, you know, selectivity returns, and uh, not necessarily with timing. So it appears no one really has the ability to time the market. It's just that uh, the fund managers that are more actively managing, they do appear to have better selective ability. Okay, so ultimately, does active management add value? Well, I just showed you some evidence from some very prominent studies. Uh, some studies will show that, you know, not really but there is some evidence that active management outperforms. Now, what could this possibly mean for the future? Well, as ETFs continue to eat the market and the percentage of passively managed funds continues to increase, uh, the value of active management should increase. Why? Well, it's because these passive managers, they're holding whatever's in a broad market index. So if you know, some fund or some stock becomes large enough, it gets added to the S&P 500. Uh, it may be the case that that stock uh, is not, it doesn't have great governance. It may underperform, even though the share price gets bid up as ETFs have to add it to their portfolio. So what I'm trying to get at here is there's the potential that uh, the best performance occurs when a large percentage of funds are held in passive funds because there's going to be greater mismanagement here. Uh, so ultimately, 
I expect active management to become more valuable in the U.S. in the future than it is today. Okay, so let's summarize. Funds can be actively managed, passively managed, or they could be closet index in indexers, basically meaning that the fund manager is just holding whatever's in the benchmark, and they're still charging a high expense ratio, saying that they're actively managing. Uh, we also looked at whether funds can outperform the market. And I showed you two studies, the Fama and French study and Doshi et al. study. And what we saw there was, a, you know, it depends on how you classify it. So some research studies have shown that there's not a whole lot of value to active management, while others show that funds that are more actively managed do have higher returns. It all depends on how you measure. And then ultimately, we're seeing a change in the conditions in the market. Basically, more investors are investing in ETFs than they used to, and this could actually turn things in favor of active management, because what we could see in the future is more mispricing uh, because you know more investors are just passively managing. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, please just feel free to, re feel free to reach out. Thank you.